But we're going to be opening, and as I've come and had the privilege of being with you guys over the last while, I've been sharing a few thoughts from uh, 1 Corinthians. And this morning, in like manner, uh, I'd like to just read a few verses with you and, and talk a little bit about what the Lord's been teaching me. And that is, uh, this morning, about what it means to live before the audience of one. And I'll explain that in a moment. Uh, Let's just pause for a word of prayer and then we'll begin. Lord, thank you again for this morning and the opportunity to sing, to praise you, to know you, and to know that you are with, uh, with us, that you abide in us. And today you call us to obedience, to walk with you and in your ways, and that we might glorify you by all that we say and do. And I thank you this morning that we can come together and open your word and trust again that you alone will speak to our hearts and minds, that you will make your word real to us, and that we can uh, look at these things knowing that they are words of life. Uh, Again, just words on a page without you, but when your presence is in their midst, sharper than any two-edged sword, able to cut through not only bone and marrow, but spirit and soul, and judge the intentions of men's hearts. I pray this morning that you would put your finger upon those things in our lives and that you would encourage us in those things in the way in which you have called us to walk today uh, in accordance with your Son. Thank you for all of this. In Jesus' name, amen. As I was with you last time, we began to talk a little bit about uh, what it meant to be a fool for Christ's sake. And we actually looked at the many weird things that God called his prophets to do. Um, they did many strange things, and as we looked at those things, uh, we, we came away with this, that God was as interested, not just in our words and what we have to say about him, but equally so in how we live for him and before him. That is, that our lives will preach as great a message as our words ever will. And we mentioned this great quote that, again, often... Our lives, the way in which we live, is the only Bible people will ever read. Lips can lie, but lives never will. And as we look on this morning, as we look at those things, as we build from there, I'd like to read about this foolishness that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians and the wisdom that we now live by. Again, many of the things we looked at, the ways in which the people were called to live, utterly foolish by human wisdom and yet in God's economy incredibly wise because he had a greater a better a more important purpose than just comfort than ease of days or ease of circumstances which again is often what fills my prayers but listen to what it says in first Corinthians and I'm going to be reading from chapter 2 And it's talking about the wisdom of God and how we understand it. It says this in verse 10 of chapter 2 in 1 Corinthians. For to us God revealed them through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except the spirit of God. Now I'm going to stop there for a moment because I think it's pretty clear. None of you can know what I'm thinking because only the inner man knows the thoughts of a man and he goes and turns that and applies that to God and says this, even so the thoughts of God nobody knows except the Spirit of God. But listen to what he then says. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God so that we may know the things freely given to us by God. Isn't that great? Only the Spirit of God knows the thoughts of God, just as only the spirit of a man or woman knows their own thoughts. And yet he says this, listen, today we've not been given the spirit of the world, but to those who've welcomed Christ into their lives, you've been given the very spirit of God. He then says this in verse 13, Which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. 
and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. But he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he will instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. You see, this morning, I love as Paul writes to this church in Corinth, this fact that here we do not live before the audience of the many. He says, listen, we walk before this world, but understand this, that all things must be spiritually appraised. What does it mean to appraise something? I have a friend who's a jeweler. And when he takes out his little eyeglass and stares at a diamond, he can tell you the, the number of carats, the quality, the quality of the cut. It's incredible. He is qualified to appraise that diamond and actually put a value on it. If I were to give that same diamond to my three-year-old today, is he equipped to appraise it? No, he will stick it in his ear, shove it up his nose, which we were thinking of getting him a nose guard. A friend of his a little while ago, you know those little foam things you stick in water and they expand? He decided to stick one of those up his nose and then it expanded. And unfortunately, the dinosaur was red that now filled his navel, nasal cavity and it took a hospital to get it out for him. So listen, uh, don't do that with foam dinosaurs. We're regressing here. But listen, don't stick diamonds up your nose either. Why? because that's not what they're good for. And that's not what they're worth. They're worth more, they're valuable, but it actually takes a trained eye to appraise them. This is what Paul's saying everyone this morning. Listen, that things are going on around you this morning and the person of the world looks at them and is incapable of appraising them. Have you ever felt the judgment of others on your life? the judgment of family members, often with students going to Bible school. And it's interesting because I'd talk to many and they would go and they'd say, I want to go to Bible school. And their parents would say this, how is that going to further your career? <laughs> Tell me how this financial investment is going to further your financial viability to live today. A and their parents would say, listen, I'll pay for university, go to VIU, but listen here, if you're gonna to go to Bible school and waste a year, you cover it, you find the funds. You see, they, they may well have known what their child wanted, but to an unbelieving parent, could they value a year studying scriptures about eternal things? No, because just as you can't read another's mind, without the mind of Christ, you don't have the ability to appraise correctly the value of something. And I want to encourage you this morning that as we read Paul's words here, he's reminding us today that we are actually living before the audience of one. That is this, he says, but he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. Why? Because today, if you truly know God and know the thoughts of God, and you are willing to now walk with God in obedience to Him, you are going to begin to value and evaluate those things based on His thoughts, not yours. Based on His desires. Based on what He wants. You know, it's interesting, but... Um, I've often referred to you guys this, and that is that sometimes when we come to the Bible, we have firmly fixed in our minds the children's storybook view of the Bible. We look at verses and stories and have the colored pictures for my, again, my three-year-old's uh, children's Bible firmly affixed in our minds. And yet often, probably for good reason, we skip over small parts and portions in the Sunday school lesson. And this morning, I've got one of those very things that at the onset made me scratch my head. It's actually all the way back in the book of Exodus, chapter 4. And I want to read it for you this morning because I, I, I've told you before, and I think it's important to remember again, that God does not mind questions. 
God does not mind when we ask him questions. That is Abraham, Genesis 15, as we looked at together, when God said, look up the stars and I will bless you. And he said, Lord, how do I know that you will bless me? God didn't say, shut up and get on with the job. No, he said, listen, I'm going to make a covenant with you, Abraham. He physically, literally, and visually gave him a promise that day. Same thing with Moses, when God came to him after he had run to the wilderness, 40 years going from a prince of Egypt to a shepherd of flocks in the desert. Uh, someone who thought, surely, as we read in the book of Acts, they will know that God has put me here to save them this day. He thought he had a place. And yet he went from there to when God called him in a burning bush. Remember his words? Go and save my people from Israel. What were his words? Send somebody else. He had gone from confident to unconfident, a somebody to a nobody. But he was exactly in the right place where God was ready to use him in the right time. But listen, he, he still had questions. What if they don't believe me? And God says, don't worry. What's that in your hand, right? And he threw down the staff and it became a serpent. And God said, pick it up. And he did, and it became a staff again. And, and, and then there was, put your hand in your cloak and, and take it out. And it was leprous. And he put it back in and took it out. And it was healed. And he said, take the water. And he poured it out. And there was blood. And again and again, he had questions. What if? What if? And what if? And God said, don't worry. I've got it covered. Well, read on, because then, after all those things, God says, now go and speak my message. And Moses, one more thing, God. <laughs> Contrasting, if you want to know just how far Moses went, in Acts, it says, as it recounts, that Moses was a man in great power in both word and deed. And yet here, God says, go and speak. And he says, well, God, I've never been eloquent even from my youth. You know what God's response is? He's never angry at questions. And yet in this moment, here's, here's what Moses says. God sends somebody else. And for the first time in scripture, we read, and God's anger burned. Why? Because God doesn't mind questions. What God minds is that when he gives answers to those questions, and when his answer is, I'm enough, and you say, still not enough? <laughs> There's a problem, isn't there? When he says, go and sin no more, and, and he says, I will give you what it takes. I will never allow you to be tempted greater than the way I've provided a way escape. And you say, huh, still can't do it. Still can't walk away. He says, I'm enough. That's when God gets angry. When we say, God, thank you, but no thank you. God, you're great, but not great enough. That's what Moses said. And yet, you know what? Even after all of this, God was incredibly merciful and gracious. Because he said, you know what? And if there were time's sake, we'd read it. He said, go and find Aaron, and I am going to make him my voice piece. But you will still be my man. Right? Wasn't that gracious? He didn't deserve to still be a part of the plan. And yet after all of this, God's incredible mercy, question after question, answer after answer, still a reluctant servant. Listen to these words in Exodus and chapter 4. After all of this, having found Aaron, it then says this, Moses, verse 18, Exodus 4, Moses departed and returned to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, please let me go that I may return to my brethren who are in Egypt and see if they are still alive. And Jethro said to Moses, go in peace. Now the Lord said to Moses, Go back to Egypt, for all the men who are seeking your life are dead. So Moses took his wife and his sons, mounted them on donkey, and as it goes, listen to this, verse 24. Hold on now, this is what doesn't come in our children's storybook. Now it came about at the lodging place on the way, he hasn't even made it to Egypt, that the Lord met him and sought to put him to death. 
So all of a sudden, out of nowhere, God wants to kill Moses. And now, listen to this. Then Zipporah, his wife, took a flint, cut off her son's foreskin, threw it at Moses' feet, and said, You are indeed a bridegroom of blood to me. So he let him alone. And that time she said, You are a bridegroom of blood because of the circumcision. Now the Lord said to Aaron, go and meet Moses. And then just the story just goes on. Isn't that bizarre? There's just three verses in there. God's going to kill Moses. His wife cuts off a foreskin, starts throwing it around the room. And then God says, okay, can t- carry on with the plan. What is going on? Well, listen, I think this is important this morning because here's what I'm learning As we are called to appraise our lives, appraise our actions and our livelihood, uh, listen, sometimes we can can miss the mark. And often where I miss it, remember how last time I was with you, we talked about seeing God in these big ways that God was going to use our lives even more than our words. And we talked about prophets doing phenomenal things, laying on their side for 390 days, right? And cooking food over dung and all these extravagant symbols. And Hosea, go and marry a prostitute. All vivid pictures to which their lives would speak. And yet here's something this morning, and that is this. Picture if Moses went into Egypt for the first time here after having been gone 40 years. And he comes in and says these words, God has raised me to free you. Follow me. I have the word of the Lord. I am a follower of the one true God, the God of Isaac and Jacob and Abraham who came before you. Imagine he said these things And then his son walked over, and you shouldn't have been peeking, but you did, and you saw his son peeing in the corner, and guess what you notice? He's not circumcised. Huh. Here's a man standing before me saying, I'm a messenger of God with the word of God, and yet when you begin to look at the inner workings of his household, was he actually following every bit of God's word and God's way? The answer is no. By custom, Jews were to circumcise their sons, and it was the father who was to do it. Well, we can tell already by what happens. Did Zipporah, his wife, want to circumcise their child? Doesn't appear so, does it? As she throws it and calls him a bridegroom of blood. You see, what's interesting here is this, and that is... Many scholars would believe that God had thrown him onto a bed of sickness. He was literally preparing to kill him. Why? Because it was usually the father who circumcised their son. And yet it was her act of obedience in doing the circumcision that actually saved him. Otherwise, he would have done it. But Moses here needed to learn a valuable lesson. And what was it? That God wasn't just interested in the big things. Staffs that turn into snakes. Hands that were leprous and healed. Jugs of water that became blood. But God was as interested in the fine details of obedience. And that to be a messenger of God was not just to have something you said or showed on the outside, but it was something that needed to affect every part of your life, even those little things on the inside. You see, as he began to look at God's things, he began to appraise them, and there began to be a part and portion where it was, this is important, this isn't important, this is important, this isn't important. Circumcision? Forget about it. That's kind of awkward anyway. Uncomfortable, difficult. And my wife, that's not her custom. Would she see the value in circumcision? Not where they were living. That may well not have been part of their, uh, their upbringing. And yet, now they've come to a place where God is saying this, listen, 
I need you to have obedience, not just in the big, but even in the little. That when someone looks at your life, the way that you live, that today they would see me. Not just carry my name, but they would see you carrying my obedience as you abide in me. You see, it's interesting, but as you go on, and just as we saw how merciful God was to Moses, God through scripture is always merciful to the sinner, something we've looked at. That time and again, God is patient with the sinner, waiting that they might bow the knee to him. And yet at the same time, God is merciless towards sin. It is opposite to him, and it is something that he cannot live with nor put up with in our lives. And in that same way, sin, to miss the mark, God was looking at Moses, a voice piece, a messenger for his will and his way. And he needed to be sure that he was not just following him part way, but all the way. You know, what's interesting is you go through scripture, there are these hallmark moments. They come out of Egypt, and as they're preparing to go into the land, does everyone remember the sin of Achan? God said, when you go into the foreign places, do not take any of the gold, do not take any animals or livestock, do not take anything that I have placed under the ban. And he had banned the loot and the riches that came with these godless nations that they were coming through. And yet Achan took and hid under his tent things from the ban. Do you remember what the response was? Well, the next battle they lost. And when the question was why, it was because someone's taken something under the ban. And they later found Achan. And they didn't just find Achan, they found his family and they burned them all. Ouch. Anani and Sapphira, ring any bells? Here we have this new beginning coming out of the slavery of Egypt into a new land with God. And God says, wake up, sin is serious. I'm a God of grace, I'm a God of salvation, but I still need you to see. Uh, new beginning, <laughs> Jesus goes to the Father. The Spirit is poured out upon the people. Ananias and Sapphira, what? Don't just lie to the people, but lie to God right? Oh yeah, we've given you all the money. What happens? Struck dead. Again, does everybody get struck dead who sins? No, but a new beginning in which God says, hey, listen, the spirit of God is in your midst now. Remember this, sin is serious. Don't continue. Just because you don't see Jesus in the flesh, my spirit is reigning with you and sees you. I'm here, I am still holy, and I've called you to be holy. I want to ask you the question this morning, as we look at these words and verses, as God's been challenging me this week, what does it mean to appraise your life? Perhaps you've had that, that pressure of God putting his finger on your heart or your life and God saying, I need you to do this. And you've begun to appraise it. And from human wisdom, it, that's not that important. From human understanding, that's just a little thing. Perhaps you see some of those areas in your life, sin, and, and you appraise them by the world standard. What's the world standard? Go and watch the daily nightly news. It is easy to feel good about yourself when you watch that. <laughs> wow, at least I'm not as bad as they are. At least I didn't kill anyone today. <laughs> I came close, but at least I'm not as bad as them, right? When all of a sudden my appraisal begins not to be Jesus, but what? The very people around me. And all of a sudden my appraisal is skewed. What has God called you to obedience in? Because often the sins that surround me are the little ones that fester, the little ones that I think will never come to light. 
the little ones that I think aren't so big a deal, right? I've appraised them and thought, it's okay. And Moses may well have sought the same thing. Listen, my wife doesn't want to circumcise them. Why go to the trouble? Why create tension, (laughs) dissension? It's just a small thing. Knowing God's eyes, a big thing. Because today when he's called you to the faith of obedience, it's obedience that he requires. And today I want to ask you and challenge you to look to the Lord and ask him to press his finger upon your heart in those areas where today you have yet to bow the knee or perhaps those things in which you have yet to pick up the right lens this morning and appraise correctly. Have you been living under the opinion of others? Maybe it's time to put down that lens, feeling condemned, feeling like I can't or couldn't, and time to pick up the right lens, that is to say, obedience, even when others don't understand. Remember our examples last time, that as we looked at those scriptures, God will call me into things that may not be just for my ease, but my betterment. Or, in fact, the bettering of others. And so, when you have possessions taken, and your neighbor stands up and says, Sue, you have the right. It's a lens, isn't it? You're looking at it from a world's perspective. And perhaps in a world's perspective, you do have the right. And yet if you'd pick up God's lens, he might say what? Don't sue, but forgive, just as I forgave you. And when you hear hate, and someone says, hate back, pay back, that's a lens. It's an appraisal of the situation an evaluation, when today God's lens might say, love back. The world's lens, fight. God's lens, serve. The world's lens, push and shove. God's lens, surrender. I am your strength. I am your knowledge. I am your wisdom. And as the world watches, again, remember, thinking that you are utterly foolish today. Remember this, 1 Corinthians, that today he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. Why? Because he who has known the mind of the Lord, who will instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. What's God calling you today? Not just the big, but the little. And that today you'd go out these doors and look at things this week with the mind of Christ. Isn't that amazing to think today that you can know God's thoughts? You can read his mind. Why? Because he's placed it within you. He's always speaking. More often than not, I'm just not listening. And you know, as I look at these things, I would say this, that often the times in which I go to God are often in the struggle, in the turmoil. I wait for God to put me halfway dead and to death before I finally go, okay, God, I surrender. Isn't that funny? I wait And I wait until he finally is going to squish me like the bug that I am. And I say, okay, now now have your way and your will, Lord. You know what I love? Daniel chapter 6. Daniel 6, in which we read these words, that those satraps and those people who are over the, the kingdom before King Darius, that they had signed a document that had said if anyone bowed down or prayed to anyone other than Darius, they must be put down, put under, fed to the lions. Do you know what it says to us in Daniel 6? And when Daniel heard that the document was signed, he went and bowed down as he did every day. 
Isn't that great? He did as he always did. That is, that Daniel simply had made it a habit to be looking through the right lens. He would not act or overreact before what? Consulting his true king. He was not going to run nor hide, flee nor fear until he waited on the one whose opinion was right and true, the direction that was the right to now move forward on. And so it says, as we look at 1 Thessalonians 5, and now pray without ceasing. Isn't that great? An ongoing conversation with our God and King, that today in everything you might see and know and appraise what is right today. How are you appraising your family members? How are you appraising your workplace? How are you appraising your job situation? How are you appraising your financial situation? Today, put down the lens of the world and pick up the mind of Christ. Take up every thought captive, hold it unto him, and know that when you follow him, he will always be faithful. It may not be comfortable. Zipporah may not have been happy. But in the midst of the discomfort, in the midst of obedience at all cost, incredible blessing. Because not only was he going to see his own freedom, but the freedom of a great people. But that would only come when he would be ready to lay down his life, his will, for the sake of the fathers. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that this morning we can come together and know that you are God, that we can come together and know that you are king of our lives and that you desire today obedience. Thank you that you are a God who speaks and that this morning as you press your fingers upon our hearts and lives in those areas in which we've been looking with the wrong lens, I pray that with the mind of Christ, we might look at the things around us, that we might be encouraged to know you and to ruthlessly both believe and follow you. Thank you that though the world may not understand, they may scoff, they may laugh, that today obedience will always lead to blessing and that we might be blessed to be a blessing to those around us. Thank you that you have given us the mind of Christ and that today we can go out these doors knowing that we are not left to our own devices. You will not allow us to be tempted more than you have provided a way of escape. You will not leave us nor forsake us. And that today you are with us in all things. Thank you for all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.